Well, good afternoon. I'm Joe Rogers. I'm the president and CEO of the Texas Heart Institute, and I'm the national principal investigator of the Bivacor Early Feasibility Trial. The Texas Heart Institute and Bivacor are pleased to announce the world's first implant of the Bivacor Total Artificial Heart in a critically ill 57-year-old man who was in cardiogenic shock and awaiting a heart transplant at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. The operation occurred on July 9th of this year. The nearly six-hour procedure was the culmination of a 12-year development program and a collaboration between the Texas Heart Institute and Bivacor. I'm happy to announce that the Bivacor heart functioned as we predicted based on our preclinical studies. We were able to demonstrate that the device provided blood flow sufficient to maintain normal vital signs and normal organ function. It allowed the patient to be liberated from the ventilator on post-operative day three and sit up in a chair on that same day. He was able to ambulate 150 meters, which is equivalent to a tenth of a mile on post-operative day seven. With activity, the device auto-regulated to provide uh, up to 12 liters of blood flow per minute, which is an amount similar to that pumped by a healthy human heart. I'm also pleased to report that, that um, after eight days of support on the Bivacor device, a suitable donor heart was identified for the patient and he's undergone successful transplantation. He celebrated his 58th birthday yesterday and he's continuing to recover from the transplant in this hospital. I'm joined today on the stage by Dr. William Cohn, a cardiac surgeon and, and Baylor College of Medicine faculty member who now serves as the chief medical officer for Bivacor. Dr. Daniel Timms, the founder of Bivacor and the inventor of this total artificial heart. Dr. Alexis Shaffey, a Baylor cardiac surgeon who led the surgical team in the implantation of the device. And Dr. Bud Frazier, a world-renowned Texas Heart Institute cardiac surgeon whose work for over 60 years on mechanical blood pumps formed the foundation for the Bivacor heart. Finally, Dr. Todd Rosengard is joining us, a cardiac surgeon and the chairman of the Department of Surgery at Baylor College of Medicine. During the course of this press conference, you'll have the opportunity to hear the unique perspectives from each of these individuals. And in addition, we have one of the Bivacor hearts at the front table. And following the pre press conference, you're welcome to join us at the front to learn more about the device. I'd now like to turn this over to Dr. Cohn to discuss the rationale for the device and the role that the Bivacor heart may play in the treatment of heart failure. Dr. Cohn. Well, thank you, Joe, and thank you all for coming. This is a big day for all of us and one that was, uh, as you heard, probably 22 years in the making. Uh, Bud Frazier and I were fortunate to be involved in the last 12. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few things. Why do we need an artificial heart? Heart failure is the number one uh, cause of, uh, of death. Uh, in the United States, maybe 150, 160,000 people die every year of, of congestive heart failure. Why don't we transplant them all? Because donor hearts are a precious and rare commodity. But the idea of making an artificial heart is not a new one. People have been trying for the last 80 or 90 years. In fact, the first artificial heart ever implanted into a human was done here by Denton Cooley on October 4th in 1969. And over the last 70 years, a lot of really brilliant artificial hearts have come and gone. Um, how is the Bivacor device different from these? All the hearts imitated our own natural beating hearts. They would fill, they would eject. They would fill, they would eject. They had flexible diaphragms and membranes and a mechanism to actuate it and inlet and outlet valves. The heart's two pumps, so there were two bladders doing that. Well, if your heart's beating 100 times a minute, that's 144,000 times every day. It's 52 million times in a year. No man-made device can do that without breaking. And that's been borne out by all these hearts. They can keep a patient alive while we're looking for a donor heart to transplant them. But they fail capriciously. The assist pumps, which is a whole other strategy, leaving the heart in place and having a turbine next to the heart to help it out, that field started here by Dr. Frazier in the, in the lab here at Texas Heart. And around the 1980s, he led a paradigm shift. Instead of these pumping uh, uh, devices going 144,000 times a day, he led the, uh, and championed the change to rapidly spinning screw-like devices, impeller-like devices, and meant nothing but uh, um, criticism from the world of heart surgeons until it was clear that he was right 
and now those are the only pumps. And that's great because they're smaller, they use less energy, and they never wear out. There's a patient who's had a pump in place for 20 years. This device that Daniel Timms and his team has developed is the first rapidly spinning continuous flow artificial heart. Uh, and although our EFS trial in this case that we're here to celebrate was a great example of using the device to keep a patient alive until we can find a transplant organ, perhaps someday this will be instead of a transplant because it's small, it's energy efficient, and it should never wear out. Daniel, what do you got to say about that? Thanks, Billy. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the device a, a little bit here. And as Billy mentioned, it's the first you know, rapidly spinning total artificial heart. Uh, the heart of the heart is this spinning disc that sits inside a magnetic field within the cavity of the device. Um, this spinning disc, when it's levitated like that, there's no mechanical wear. So that means the device should really never really wear out so long as it's getting power. On each side of this spinning disc has little blades, little fins, one side pumping the blood to the lung, the other side pumping the blood to the body. As Dr. Cohen mentioned, these are traditionally called continuous flow pumps. It's, rep it's spinning at one particular speed. However, what we managed to do is increase the speed of the rotor once a second, so rapidly up, rapidly down, rapidly up, rapidly down, and that induces a pulsatile outflow from the device, and I think Dr. Cohen wants to uh, show what that uh, sounds like. So that's the device rapidly up and down, up and down, up and down, producing that pulsatile outflow. So utilizing this technology though, it means that it can be significantly smaller. And uh, you can see the size of the device here, uh, which means it can fit in a lot more people um, you know, across the world. So traditional total artificial hearts, they break, but they're also large and they can't fit in everybody. Uh, so that's a bit of a challenge there. Our patient though, you'll notice here next to the device is powered by this controller. This controller is tethered to the device through a, a cable that will come out of the skin and they'll carry around this uh, little backpack here. In that backpack has a number of batteries that can be exchanged uh, so the patient can be portable. As we proceed through this technology, we have the opportunity to remove that drive line and just power the device through the skin, similar to how you charge your phone. Um, as we progress through, then that's our ultimate goal. When we find that stage, we feel like we can rival heart transplantation. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Next, I'll turn this to Dr. Shafi, who uh, could provide us some insights from your experience implanting the device and the care of the patient. Alexis? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we've, uh, we've been working on this down in the basement uh, with the animals, and uh, we've worked out all the details as far as the technical details uh, in implanting these. So as far as the implantation in the human, uh, it went went as 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 we would expect straightforward no complications we it was a very brisk operation uh the technology is fascinating uh the ability to bridge these uh, patients who otherwise don't have an opportunity uh to get an organ transplant in time uh, is 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 very special uh we see a number of these patients who who don't make it to transplant and, and having this uh, fascinating and, and uh, you know, technologically advanced device is offering something special to the field. Um, the patient uh, recovery uh, was uh, very good. Uh, he, he progressed uh, quite uh, quickly as far as getting off the ventilator and, and his organ function recovering on the device uh, uh, went very quickly. So. Uh, you know, overall, I think clinically, uh, it performed very well. Thank you. Well, 60 years of experience, Dr. Frazier, with mechanical blood pumps. We'd be interested to hearing your, hear your perspective. 61. Anyway, uh, I went to Baylor. I decided to go to Baylor because I had a girlfriend in Houston who's fortunately now my wife. And, uh, but, I was an English history major. I didn't. I wasn't that interested in science. The the uh, thing at Baylor at that time there were 75 students in the class, and you had to do a research experiment every year. And I, of course, had no interest in that. And uh, once you started medical school in September, by November the first, you had to have your name of your research project. 
And uh, I had a fraternity brother, a good friend, who was just as opposite for me as you could get. He was always two weeks ahead of everybody, and I was two weeks behind. And uh, I was waiting for the elevator over in the Baylor building. The elevator's still there, actually. And, uh, and he came up to me and he said, Bud, what are you doing for your research experiment? And it was October the 30th. I said, well, I've got another day. I hadn't thought about it. And he said, I knew you wouldn't have done anything. I've already signed you up. I'm going to do an artificial heart experiment with Dr. Leota and Dr. DeBakey. I can't do it all by myself. All you have to do is show up next Tuesday in the lab, and we'll start your research. So that's how I got into artificial hearts. And uh, my friend uh, went into medicine, and uh, his name was Frank Polk, and he went to Johns Hopkins as an internist, and he's, there's a wing in, in uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital called the Polk Wing. He tragically died of uh, brain cancer in his 40s but he was a great contributor. And anyway, I started working with Leona and Dr. DeBakey on, and we put the first artificial heart, or I helped as a medical student, in October of 1963. So it's been a long time. By the early 80s, it became obvious to me that we needed a continuous flow pump. Nobody believed in that. I wish somebody else had. But, uh, and because the postal pumps, just as Billy said, they had no durability, so they were just a bridge to transplant. And we had a waiting people on the waiting list for transplants anyway. So that's when I started working on the continuous flow left ventricular assist devices. There have been over 100,000 implanted worldwide, and there have been uh, patients that have had them over 20 years with just one pump. The pumps have not been pumped to failure, which is the main reason I started working on continuous flow, because to obviate the failure. We started working on the total heart when Daniel Timms brought us this continuous flow total heart, which I think will, will replace heart transplants. I've, I've done over 1,300 heart transplants. It's a great operation, but it's not durable and it depends on someone else's misfortune. You can't just bring it off the shelf. So anyway, hopefully we'll have this up and running in uh, another decade for sure, and hopefully for a replacement for transplants, not as a bridge to transplant. Thanks, Dr. Frazier. And next, Dr. Rosengart. Thank you, Joe. So just to uh, close this out, I just a couple of comments uh, reflecting some different facets of uh, this extraordinary event today. Um, first, I'd like to remind everyone, and as we heard, there is no such thing as an overnight wonder. Today's announced landmark event, as we heard, represents a decade of careful diligence and perseverance that is a true tribute to the Bivacor team, the Texas Heart team, and especially Drs. Uh, Cohen and Frazier, two truly great uh, giants in this field. To this point, personal anecdote, I can can't tell you how many times I'd find Bud or Billy in the hallway and they'd be saying, well, we're almost done. When is it going to be done? Well, we've got one more thing to work on. Well, thank God someone came up with the phrase, perfection is the enemy of great. Uh, otherwise, we may not have been there to this point today. In that context, I really want to remind everyone that this never would have happened without the great collaboration in the ecosystem that we enjoy here at the Texas Medical Center. Not only does it allow robust discovery and invention such as we heard about, we're hearing about today, but it's really reflective of a tremendous collaboration between Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Heart, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, and really the entire ecosystem of the TMC, really a unique entity in the entire world. The mutual and unwavering support uh, that no doubt underlies this success truly would not be possible in most medical centers uh, universally. The strength of that collaboration and the engineering prowess of Bivacor and the innovative minds of Drs. Cohn and Frazier really combined with the excellence in terms of surgical technique, 
of our, our, my colleagues, Dr. Ken Liao, Chief of the Division of uh, Cardiothoracic Surgery, and Dr. Shafi, really shows an amazing melding of the master surgeons, great technology, and brilliant minds. So finally, in support of that network, I'd like to point out that this ecosystem that we enjoy at the Texas Medical Center can be expanded by talking about the ecosystem of support that we enjoy in the Houston community at large. In many ways, this probably would not have come to pass to this day if we could not have counted on that tremendous support. Dr. Cohn has one of his innumerable um, amusing anecdotes to share about how he bridged that gap to make this happen. And overall, this is really a reflection, not just of individual accomplishment, but truly the accomplishment of a great team. So I'm glad we're all here to celebrate today, and I appreciate uh, the privilege of uh, sharing the Baylor perspective on this very wonderful day. Joe, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rosengard. <clears throat> Just to remind everyone, the early feasibility study of the Bivacor device is designed to test the safety and effectiveness of this pump in five patients. If successful, the next phase of the investigation will be a larger pivotal trial that will examine the role of this device as a longer-term option for patients with advanced heart failure. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge a few individuals and teams. First and most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the patient and his family. The courage that he displayed was remarkable, and uh, he, he is a wonderful spirit, uh, and I'm so pleased, I think we, this whole team is pleased with um, his outcome. I want to thank the clinical team. Uh, there were hundreds of people that surrounded the patient to make this happen. It, it showed the very best of the Texas Heart Institute, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, and Baylor College of Medicine. I would be remiss without thanking the research teams at the Texas Heart Institute, the clinical research team and the Center for Preclinical Surgical and Interventional Research, who did all of the preclinical work that led up to the successful implant of this device. To our collaborators, the team at Bivacor, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center and Dr. Lemke, Dr. Plana, the Texas Medical Center who Dr. Rosengart alluded to earlier with, Dr., uh, with Mr. Bill McKeon who runs TMC right now and is an innovator in his own right. Our board uh, of the Texas Heart Institute and the donors who have supported this research, Jim Dillon and the team, the administrative team at Bivacor, to all of you, we extend our heartfelt thanks and look forward to moving this project forward. I'll stop there and we will invite questions from the audience uh, and with the intention of continuing for about 10 minutes and then we will adjourn the, uh, the program. Hi, doctor. Uh, apologies uh, if this is a reductive question, um, but can you uh, kind of underscore in a simple sentence for us what is sort of the breakthrough aspect of this device? Uh, we've already had other companies contacting our news outlet <laughs> claiming that you know their device is similar, etc. So, what is the distinguishing factor? Is it the size that you mentioned, doctor? Uh, what is it? And how many patients do you hope that this will impact? How many people would be in that threshold of waiting in so organ? Uh, let me answer your second question first, and then I'll have Dr. Cohn explain what what the real innovation is in this space. We've had a very difficult time estimating the patient population in the United States that might benefit from advanced heart failure therapies. We think that it's somewhere between about 5 and 10 percent of all of the patients who have heart failure have this very advanced stage of the disease. And we estimate that number to be about 250,000 Americans. Dr. Cohn, would you like to comment on the first question? Yeah, it's a great question uh, because there have been a lot of artificial hearts. In fact, there's one that's approved as a temporary artificial heart, and it's a brilliant device and has saved a lot of lives. But the average time it's in a patient's chest is 90 days. There has been a patient that went seven years. We had two patients that went four years before their pumps broke and they died. Uh, most pumps that have flexible membranes can't go more than a year or a year and a half. By leveraging a rapidly spinning member, this device should be able to pump forever. It's much smaller. It uses much, ener much less energy. For all those reasons, we think this heart will do to artificial heart field what the rapidly spinning turbine, like Dick Cheney had, did for that field. We think this will be the first potentially permanent artificial heart. And the reason it's so robust Daniel's going to describe. 
Sure. I mean, I guess another analogy that Billy likes to use is the uh, flapping wings of a bird and an airplane that's used fixed uh, fixed wing with uh, jet engines to, to fly. Um, and that's a, a paradigm shift with these devices. Um, the first, this is the first device that is able to support the entire circulation of the body with a rapidly spinning, one single rapidly spinning disc. And uh, it doesn't wear out because it's in a magnetic field. So there's other devices that have magnetic fields, but they don't support the entire circulation. So this is building on the shoulders of giants like Dr. Frazier and bringing all of that, um, I guess, the technology from the field all together in the combination of this spinning disc uh, that will not wear out. Another comparison is the other attempts at a, con a completely implantable permanent artificial heart have had several hundred moving parts. This has one. They've been limited at seven or eight or nine liters of flow. We've seen an animal on a treadmill with a flow of 21 liters a minute with this device. Uh, our patient walked with a cardiac output from the Bivacor device of 12 liters a minute heretofore previously never shown by any device. 11? 12. 12. 12 liters a minute. We'll say 11 and a half. No, uh, 12. Uh, that's never been done in the history of the field. So much smaller, much more durable, uses a fraction of the energy, generates much more flow. Do you know anybody who's ever had an artificial heart? I don't either. They haven't succeeded. This might be the first successful one. And if it's not, the way this device functions, everybody's going to start working on similar things. I don't think anybody flew anywhere on the right flyer, but it was still a really impactful experiment. But is it accurate to call this a permanent transplant artificial heart? It's premature. We have to do that experiment. I can tell you in Huntington Beach, we have eight pumps that have been going for more than two years without a failure in an aquarium. So could this be a permanent device? Absolutely. Do we need to show that it's safe and effective as a permanent device? Absolutely. And the patient that you implanted, they've gone on to get a donor heart? That's so correct. So they do not still have this implant inside of them? That's correct. Okay. And Dr. Frazier, as you were saying, that you think this is going to be available as a permanent option when? Let's hold it thank you. A microphone, please. Far. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I just keep missing. You know, there would, there's no reason to work on anything else because this this syncardia, these other temporary pumps and their temporary uh, work very well, actually. But we need a durable pump. And uh, until we do that, these pumps will have no, what we call epidemiologic effect on heart failure or transplants. That's what Dr. Shumway, who started the heart transplant field, who went to school in my hometown, used to tell me at every meeting that I, I, as long as there's a bridge to transplant, we were just adding people to the transplant list. And as I said, we have 20-year patients with continuous flow pumps. They've never been pumped to mechanical failure. This won't either, I don't believe. I don't see any. It should be called a permanent artificial heart, no matter what Billy says, to differentiate it, because otherwise there's no reason to have it. You're exactly, your implication that the artificial heart, we've got a good temporary artificial heart and it works well, but this is not designed to do that. Daniel? Yeah, I'll just add one more comment if I can to that. Um, the device design is to be a long-term solution to um, uh, heart failure there. Um, by, by inherently by its design, um, it can do that. We need to prove it out, as Billy says. Uh, but from the very beginning, 20 years ago, when the concept was created, I don't want to work on something that's temporary. I want to work on something that can be a solution. Uh, back in Australia, when I'm working with my team, this is what we are trying to achieve. This is the first step, though. We, we know we can't just go straight away and make something that's uh, long-term, straight away. We just need to test it out, evaluate it, and then go back, check things, go ahead even further than that. So step by step, we're going to uh, achieve that ultimate goal. And did Australia support you in those efforts? Absolutely, as much as they could. Yes, ma'am. So uh, th through all of the testing, step by step, reasonably speaking, when do you think uh, the device might be approved and available? Commercially available. Yeah, so, I th so the development plan for this device right now is to complete the safety trial, which will provide the evidence that will allow us to launch into a longer term study. That longer term study will include people that we 
intend to transplant, but people who may not have transplantation as an option. Uh, and so we will need to get through that phase of the study. If you were guessing, I would say probably commercially could be available if everything went well in the next five years, potentially. And one additional note is these trials are multi-center. We have other programs train up, and when we knocked on doors, every door we knocked on wanted to participate. We're in scrubs because this morning we had five people from Columbia Presbyterian here visiting us from New York, training up on the device, their surgeon, their heart failure, their chief of uh, heart failure. And uh, so we have 10 very prestigious programs that have trained up. We could have 30. And four of the sites are activated, the Texas Heart Institute, Duke, Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, where Rob Dowling, Rob, where are you? is a leader in total artificial heart work. Banner in Arizona, Francisco Arabia there has done more artificial hearts than anybody in the world, and they've all come and joined our team. And that, I think, speaks to, is this technology different than what we had here before previously? And I think yes. I want to be respectful of people's times. We can take one more question, and then I'd like to close the press conference. But again, we have the device up here at the front table. If people would like to come up and see it, and you know, interact with the device, we can explain a little bit more about how it works. One thing I'd like to emphasize, she's exactly right. We shouldn't call it an artificial heart. I don't know what to call it. A permanent artificial heart, it's, I, I think it's fair enough because that's its goal. But uh, right now, just like in all these studies, you do bridge the transplant first, you take the pump out and see how, how it looks. We can only go 90, 94 days in the calf. Permanent yes. artificial heart, but not permanent transplant. Transplants aren't permanent. You know, that's the other reason I started working on them. I started doing them in 1982, July the 4th, 1982. Dr. Cooley didn't want to fool with them at all, but I ended up doing more heart transplants than anyone in the world. And, and that taught me that they're temporary, you know, when the patients start dying after five years, 10 years, there, there's, uh, you've, we've got to do something better. If we transplant a 20 year old, chances of them seeing 40 are, are pretty low. So we have to have a better approach and I think this uh, will address that. And I don't know what to call it. Haley, right. maybe it's an artificial heart doesn't Cutting gain out much. Heart and sewing something in is a transplant, but by common usage, that means another human heart. Right. right. But it is for all practical intents and purposes. I was going to say we, we probably should come up with the right nomenclature, but we would call this no, an implant of, a, of an artificial heart or a to, you know, an art, total artificial heart, huh. where transplants typically refer to putting <laughs> a bi piece of biological yeah. tissue into a human being. A rose is a rose. Is but I'm a journalist and I like those words. Sure. <laughs> Understand. We like whatever you write. Do we have a. Could it in so the question was, is it possible that this could increase the, the number of patients who were awaiting transplantation? I, I believe that that's possibly true. Uh, that we, we would be, be able to say we can take people who might have some relative contraindication to transplantation because their blood flow is abnormal, support them with this device, and have them convert into a much better candidate for transplantation. So this idea of a bridge to candidacy is, is an obvious use of this device. You're correct. That doesn't change the number of donors. Does, that's the problem with it. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for attending today, and we're, you're welcome to come up and uh, see the pump. <laughs>